Hello, and welcome to Casa San Isidro's time travel at the Santa Fe Presidio. Today we are here at the Presidio talking to those who have made a life for themselves on the edge of the frontier of the Spanish territory. After two long years, a caravan has made its way up El Camino Real from Mexico City into Santa Fe, and people from far and near have come to purchase goods and trade. Hi, I'm Sofia Delgado, and I live here in Santa Fe, and I work right here at the Presidio. Generally, my job is working in the weaving room, you know, from the time that a sheep is sheared until the looms are weaving the blankets. There's a lot of other tasks that need to be done. We need to wash the wool, then we need to comb the wool, straighten the fibers, then we need to spin the fibers to twist them into yarn. And my favorite part is then dyeing that yarn. And we gather different kinds of plants and flowers that grow all around here. And we get some beautiful colors of our yarn. However, I have been asked to help in the kitchen right now because a um, caravan is due up the Camino Real from Mexico City and there will be um, many people coming, bringing goods. We will also have a lot of people from Santa Fe and even outlying areas in the Pueblos coming in because everybody wants to see what goods we've got for bartering and trading. So what I've been asked to do is a task that has to be done daily, morning, noon, and night, which is grinding corn. We start out with our dried corn that was uh, stored over the winter. And the job, my job is going to be to convert it from corn that looks like that to the corn meal. This is when it's been all ground up. And then we'll take this cornmeal, mix it with some water, and we will make our tortillas. So, let me show you how it's going to be done. I'm going to start with my corn right here. Now, corn is a crop that we grow um, in fields. It grows well in this area. The soil is good. We get enough sun. We get just enough rain. We harvest the ears in the fall and dry them and they store well through the whole winter so we always have corn to eat 12 months out of the year. So what I need to do is take this dried corn that we stored away last winter and I need to make something that we can eat out of this. Now this dried corn is inedible so that's why we have to grind it. And for grinding it, we're going to use these two tools right here, a mano e matate. The mano is the, the tool that I'll hold in my hand. Mano means hand. And I will grind on the matate here. Um, this, these, this matate is made out of basalt, which is a volcanic rock, an igneous rock. Um, it's perfect for grinding corn because it has all these little holes in it that formed when the lava hardened. And it's a very rough, sharp surface, which we need because the coating on the corn is very hard. So I'm going to go ahead and set some corn up here on the uh, matate. Matate means grinding surface. So we're going to be grinding like this. And we do it by just rubbing back and forth. It's an up and down, back and forth, scraping the corn under the mono like this. And the reason why we do it like, we don't want to pound. Pounding is done with a different tool called a mortar and pestle. This is just rubbing. Now I want you to be thinking how much work this is, how much physical labor. It's 
starts with the muscles in my fingers, up my hands, going up my arms, my shoulders, and my back are all part of this. And I'm just going to keep rubbing and rubbing and rubbing. And it's just beginning to start breaking down. <clears throat> if you want to look a little more closely, you can see how the pieces are starting to break apart here. It's not something that happens quickly. All right, now, as I keep working, if you look a little closely, you can see how the corn is starting to break down. Remember, the goal is to get something that looks like this. So I still have a ways to go. This particular matate, my grandparents brought with them when they moved up here from Mexico. This one right next to me here, this is one of the um, mano y matates that was here when we got here. The people who have lived here for hundreds of years use ones that look like this. But it was good to see, my grandmother said when she got here, that some of the things that they were used to doing in Mexico, they also do right up here. Now, it's not just corn that we grind with matates. Other things like um, pine nuts and um, wild Indian rice grass. But we want a different kind of matate for that. We need one that is um, a smoother surface made out of sandstone or even limestone because when those nuts and seeds are ground, they, they release a sort of a resin that gets sticky and it would just um, fill in the holes of a matate like this. So we have specialized tools for the different jobs that we do. All right, so you can see I've been working, rubbing. I can use the corner right here to do a little more. At this point, we've got some, but you can imagine we're going to need a lot more in order to make enough tortillas to feed all the people we're expecting to feed. Probably a couple of hundred tortillas is what we're going to need today. Once it's all been ground into our masa, then we'll put it into a bowl. We'll mix it with a little water. Then we've got our dough. And then we'll um, take the dough and we'll shape it into our tortillas. And the tortillas are cooked on a, um, a flat stone called a kamal that's just set on top of the fire. And they're just set down there and then turned over and taken off the fire. And there is your tortilla. Now what you need to appreciate about this is these materials, these tools that we're using, we found um, right here in our environment. And I have heard that it's not just up here and in Mexico where this kind of process is used. This kind of process is used um, probably all around the world and has certainly been used for hundreds of years. So this is just an example of how people survive by making use of the resources that they find in their environment. So I really appreciate you stopping by and seeing what's going on today. Thank you. Good morning, I am Maria Isabella Reyes y Rodriguez, and I have just arrived here in Santa Fe after the journey from Mexico City on the annual caravan. My husband is a merchant in Mexico City, and he, has, he specializes in uh, Asian and European goods that come from the Manila Galleons and also from Europe his shop is very close to El Perion, the store in Mexico City that specializes in Asian goods. Last year he traveled to Acapulco 
to meet the Manila galleons when they arrived with their cargo of goods and for the January silk fair that's held every year when the galleons arrive. This is the first time that we've made the caravan from Mexico City to the northern frontier here. And I, for one, will never repeat that journey except for the return home because it was very long, very arduous, very slow and dangerous. There's always the threat of robbers, hostile natives, accidents, um, and it's very slow going because we brought livestock to eat along the way. So the pace of the caravan is as slow as the slowest pig. So I'm looking forward to going back home. And the caravan, when it returns, will bring raw wool, hides, and finished blankets for sale in Mexico and along the way. Today, I'm going to show you some luxury goods that we have brought from, um, from Mexico City. And they're the very latest styles in Mexico City and also in Lima, Peru. And as you know, or you may know, Mexico City and Lima are very wealthy cosmopolitan cities that are every bit as fashionable and um, wealthy as any city in Spain. In fact, most of the Asian goods that come from Acapulco and the, on the Manila galleons stay in the New World, and very few actually are shipped to Spain. So a lot of the wealth, and a lot of wealth, stays in the New World. So today I'm going to show you my outfit, which is the very latest style in Mexico City in 1712. What I'm wearing today is a silk, taffeta skirt from China, made with Chinese silk, and what is called galoon trim. The galoon trim is made of very thin sheets of gold or silver that are wrapped around silk thread, then glued to a paper or hide or leather uh, backing to be sewn onto the fabric. And I'm also wearing a bodice of Chinese brocade. My blouse is made of Flemish linen, very white, because white linen is the most desirable. And it's trimmed with lace from Lorraine, France. And I'm also wearing pearls, which I will discuss the jewelry in a little while. But I would also like to show you some of the goods that we brought from uh, up from Mexico City that are going to be for sale at the Presidio store. We have very nice Flemish linen, such as this that's embroidered, more lace from France. We have Chinese embroidered shawls, which are very popular, the latest style. We also have printed cotton from India that's also quite nice for you. A few pieces of Chinese blue and white porcelain. This piece didn't make it uh, without being chipped, but some of them did. I brought some thin pieces, narrow pieces of metal galoon 
The silver and the gold are actually metal and they're sold at five pesos per ounce. This is very nice for decorating jackets or um, sleeves. We have a variety of silk satin ribbons from China. The narrow ribbons are rather inexpensive. We also have some wider silk satin ribbon, of course more expensive. I have also brought a variety of embroidery floss, silk embroidery floss also from China, along with some notions from Europe that you might also need to purchase. I have the prices for some of these items. The cotton cloth from India is four pesos per vara. The silk galloon is five, as I said, five pesos per ounce. Oh, Lorraine lace, the narrow Lorraine lace is one peso, four reales per vara. The best silk and cotton rebozos are 25 pesos each. Now you must remember that these are expensive goods that come from far away, travel very far, and a fully trained mule can be bought for 30 pesos. So these are very expensive goods. But I know that a lot of you ladies are the wives of prosperous ranchers and merchants and politicians here in Santa Fe. And I would like to show you some of the pearls that we brought. Black pearls, white pearls, and coral beads. Pearls were so abundant in Southeast Asia and even the Caribbean and the Pacific Coast that they were very, very inexpensive. And when they were brought to Spain, they were actually sold in baskets or bowls as if they were beans because they were so inexpensive. And again, servants um, and people of all castes could wear pearls. So I'm going to show you my jewelry too. I'm wearing pearls and a coral and pearl necklace, choker, which is very popular throughout the New World. Five strand pairs of bracelets are also very popular right now, as well as pairs of coral bracelets or glass beads, mainly green glass bead bracelets. I'm also wearing pearl drop earrings. It's very popular to have earrings with multiple pearls dangling down. Black pearl bracelet. And abalone jewelry is very popular. Here is an abalone shell necklace. We also have brought a few pieces of jewelry, such as these thin rings, finger rings, which are called trombago. It is, these are made in China and Asia, uh, but they also make trombago in Mexico and the New World. It is an alloy of gold, silver, and copper which is then acid washed to remove the copper finish. So it looks like beautiful solid gold, but it's less expensive, of course. It's more expensive than silver, but less expensive than solid gold. So I hope 
that you will come to the Presidio store and see what they have to offer and be able to purchase it so that, you know, you can be just as fashionable here in the northern frontier as the ladies in Mexico City, Lima, Seville, Madrid, because it's available here. Thank you. Hello, Captain Valdez. Oh, hello. Who am I speaking to? Uh, my name is Jose Leon Gonzalez. Oh, Jose, yes, yes. How is your mother? She's doing well now. Very good, very good. Yes, uh, I talked to your father just recently. Um, he said that you would like to come and speak to me. So uh, how can I help you this afternoon? Yes, Captain, I'm actually interested in joining, uh, becoming a soldier. That's, that's a wonderful location. I, it's my own and it, it has served me well over the years. How can I help you in this uh, quest? Uh, I was just wondering what it might require uh, to actually become a soldier. Mm, okay. Well, first of all, the, the official requirements. We, we really, you must be five feet two. You must be a Roman Catholic. You must not be disfigured. You must be sound in, in mind and body. Um, we prefer people of good family and good background, but that's not really a requirement. Um, beyond that, if you can ride a horse and ride a horse all day, that will take you a long way in this particular cavalry. Um, if you can read and write, that will also open up avenues for you that might not be so available. Most soldiers can't. Where did you enlist and why did you enlist, Captain? I came from Spain originally, as you can tell from my accent. Um, my father was a, a, a fairly wealthy man, uh, not particularly big, but not small. Uh, my mother had seven children who uh, survived to adulthood. My three sisters were all married off to families, good families. My brothers, uh, my eldest brother, of course, inherited the property. So my father spent his life training my brother in how to run the horse family horse property. Um, my second brother became a priest. Uh, my father managed to get him into a seminary, so he moved on within the church. By the time I became of age, there wasn't much left, so my father was unable to purchase a commission for me, but he did get me a seat in the War College in Madrid. So when I graduated from War College, with excellent grades, I might say, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant and was requested to go to the New World. Well, would you say it has been worth your experience? How, how much are they paying you? Well, the military life can be, can be chancy sometimes. Uh, the money is, is good uh, for, a, for a new recruit. That'll be 290 pesos uh, per year. You'll get that about twice a year. Uh, you'll be expected to pay for a lot of your own stuff, but uh, things like cigars will be provided to you at fair prices. Things like meat and food, corn for your family will be provided to you. Um, not only that, but the salary that you get is also on deposit with the paymaster in the Presidio. And so you can go to the store and borrow against your salary. This can be very good. You can borrow, you can get trade goods, you can trade, come back, pay off your debt, and end up quite a wealthy man. As a matter of fact, I myself have taken advantage of the trading opportunities of being a soldier. And I would have to say now that although my older brother has a wonderful horse farm, I have far more cattle than he has horses. As a matter of fact, I may actually be wealthier than he or my father ever was here on the frontier. Wow. Well, I know it's pretty dangerous on the frontier. How am I supposed to protect myself? Oh, yes. You know, the problem with the frontier is that uh, there are people here who would like to have what we have brought here with us. And so they become bandits, and they find it would be easier to steal than it would be to work. And we're here to stop that.
we're here to band together. Uh, although there are only a few soldiers, every soldier has the right to request help from the, the natives and help from the local landowners in terms of uh, conscripts and uh, soldiers and help. So yes, there is the possibility of getting killed, but you know, if you go to church and keep clean with God, you'll come through it with no problem at all. When, uh, when a soldier is, uh, is recruited, one of the understandings is that he's going to put 10 years into the organization. And so for that 10 years, you'll be under military discipline. Um, that may not be that you'll always be in uniform doing things. Oftentimes you'll be in your own place. However, when you're required, you will don the uniform and you will show up and you will do as you're told. This all sounds very dangerous. Would you say it's worth it? How am I supposed to get paid for this? I'll be honest, we really prefer to recruit people that are here for the duty, for God and King. This is an important position and it requires the best of people that we have. However, there is a lot of money to be made soldiering. Uh, there is land, there is cattle. Every place you go, from the houses of the rich to the hovels of the poor, you'll be welcome. You'll be fed the best that they have, and that's all the way up and down the trail, all the way to Sonora and back. You'll be home for Christmas, but you'll be gone for the springtime. I'm interested in, in, your, in your recruitment. I, uh, I think that you might be a, a man of, uh, of character that we'd like to have in, in the Presidio. Uh, our mission here is to uh, protect the settlers. Um, we also have a very complicated relationship with the Native Americans here. As a soldier, what are you given to protect yourself? Yes. The soldier's tools of the trade are the sword, the pistol, and the lance. The lance is much too big to bring inside. It's nine feet long. However, the sword, swords have been around for a long time. This sword has been passed down from my grandfather to me for, from generation to generation. It never fails. The pistol is brand new and is very powerful, but it often fails. This is very interesting, Jose. Uh, I've talked to your father. I think you would make a very good candidate for the Presidio Soldiers. I will have to consult with the Viceroy, though, before a final decision can be made, but I would have to say it looks very positive in your favor. Thank you, Captain. I will speak with my father. Have a good day. Hi, my name is Margarita Arando Rodrigo. I was born in 1662, a little ways out of Santa Fe, on a rancho that was established by my great-grandfather when he came to the area with Oñate in 1598. I have three brothers, Ramon, Enrique, went to Mexico City because they were not interested in farming. The other brother, Miguel, stayed in the area. In 1678, I married a soldier from the fort, Juan Ricardo Diaz. So I moved into Santa Fe and I was very skillful with a needle and thread. So I did sewing for the ladies in the Presidio. In 1680, things became a little unnerving, shall we say, in the fort. Uh, the Indians were acting a little bit strange and people were a little bit worried about what might be happening. But the Indians said that they would let us leave in three days and they would be peaceful. So we took that long trek to El Paso. We started off with about a thousand people, but by the time we got to El Paso, there was only about half of us left. My poor father never made it. We stayed in El Paso for about 12 years. And during that time, my mother died. But Miguel, my younger brother, took a wife. So de Vargas took the settlers back. We went back. Miguel was anxious to get the rancho going again. Of course, it was all burned out. But we've been here now for, for 20 years. The rancho has been rebuilt. 
We have a nice orchard of fruit trees. We raise sheep and a few chickens. We use the wool to help us sustain our livelihood by selling the wool. We do sell the lambs. We go into Santa Fe about once a month and we take our crops. We have a vegetable garden that we take care of and that pretty much feeds us and what we have left we can usually trade in Santa Fe. I used to sew for the ladies in the Santa Fe. Since my hands have become so crippled that I can no longer sew, it's very hard for me to, to handle the needle. However, the crocheting uh, and the uh, needlework has a different needle. So I have been able to do some embroidery work that I can either sell or trade, and it makes up for the, some of the provisions that we have not been able to provide for ourselves on the Rancho. My name, once again, is Margarita, and these will be available for sale at our trade fair in Santa Fe. So come on down, take a look at these, uh, and there, of course, there are many other things that will be available for sale or trade, and we look forward to seeing you there. Buenos dias. Soy Juan de Cristos. I'm a Franciscan friar from the Pueblo of Zuni in the year of our Lord 1710. I walked up from Mexico City with a uh, train of burros with, with traders coming up the Rio Grande in order to get to my placement, which was in Zuni. I have been there for the last two years, and it is hard work because the people still are not trusting of, of the Spanish. They also do not respect the, the priests and the brothers as they once did. They have much pain that they carry with them because of the treatment they had received. I have come up to the Pueblos to help out uh, during this time. Uh, they have been having a uh, smallpox epidemic, or at least what we call smallpox, but it's a terrible thing that goes through everyone and they need someone to care for them while they are sick. And so as a Franciscan, that is my job and my task uh, in my ministry. I've been asked to come to share with you today some of the what I have learned from the Zunis. The Zuni people are Native American people and they have a long, rich culture. Part of their religion is a connection to the animals, for the animals are part and parcel of, of the world and the earth. Will different people will ha have a, a particular animal that they choose? And I care to share with you the way that they understand their places in the, in the uh, nature of things. First we have the mountain lion and the mountain lion is in the north and that is a place that the mountain lion always holds is the north position and the mountain lion is the elder brother to the bear. The bear is always associated with the west and the bear is the elder brother to the badger and the badger is the elder brother to the wolf. The wolf who is in the east. And then we have the sky eagle, who is the direction of the sky, and his elder brother to the mole, who is over the earth. Animals with, with uh, things tied to them. It's gifts to the, to the animal spirit not to this one, but to the animal spirit for being able to have the, the, uh, the carving. And oftentimes it, it would be something like turquoise. Uh, here we have a piece of coral, uh, the red, red coral, and that's a piece of shell um, traded from the ocean. <clears throat> uh, oftentimes they would um, 
That's something else that they would do, is that they might uh, keep the, the fetish in, in uh, an olla, uh, and then they would have a hole on the side and they would feed the fetish with either ground, ground turquoise or blue corn. This is the way that they position them if they want a prayer, prayers for healing. This is what the people do when their, their shamans will place the creatures in this, in this order. And then, but it's not only if they, if they were to have, say, a time for, for war or battle, there would be uh, two of these would be out and they'd have two others take the place. But I would like you to understand that this is the way that they see all of these creatures together. But being what they are, what people are, is one person may carry, say, a mountain lion, especially a warrior or a healer, because this is the one, the mountain lion has the most spiritual power, and they call upon that power. Now, it's not inherent in here, but it's the spirit of mountain lions that they call upon to bring about healing or sustenance. They have the, it may be that a person has in a dream been told that the bear is his spirit power and that the bear will, it is the spirit of the bear that will inhabit him the, of courage and of great strength. And so a warrior may, may carry one into battle or may carry one if he goes off to to hunt, uh, say, if you want to, to uh, hunt a bear that's been sighted, he may call upon the mountain lion, who is a senior spiritual, spiritual animal. It may be that someone has felt that the, the wolf was their spirit animal and had called them. And so they may carry it with them, just because they're attuned to those spiritual powers. Uh, they, they're not inherent, but they're part of the, the great spirit of the world. The, all the animals are part and parcel of all the earth. That they all would carry one because many different people, some people don't carry any, but if they feel that they have a special need, they may ask for one from one of the other people. Or they may find a rock that looks like the animal that they're from. They are very, very deeply religious people, deeply spiritual people. Uh, they have been open to Christian faith, but they never have given up their, their faith from thousands of years. As one of, the, as one of the men told me, he said, we have danced for rain every year for generations asking for rain for our crops. We are not going to give that up because they have cared for us these many years. We will go as, as, the, uh, as the brother asked to worship in their, in their churches. But that is just in addition to what we already have. There are priests who do not like that, he said. But what are you gonna do? We chased them out once, we can do so again. I think there's some wisdom to what he said, but don't tell the father that I said that. Thank you.